Today, it's part two in our series, Beef on Dairy, as Dr. Ty Lawrence of West Texas A&M University continues walking us through this topic. Last week, he provided an overview, and then we started with the good, then into the bad, and this week, we'll get in to the ugly. Ugly is really just one issue, and it's an issue that goes back to One of the reasons that the Packers said we don't want purebred Holsteins anymore. Then my questions as a beef rancher, is beef on dairy animals a competitor to my ranch raised beef? The ugly has to be cleaned up before these things become competitive. And we'll conclude with what can we learn from the dairy industry? You just don't see that velocity of improvement in a traditional beef ranching scenario. It's real, it's honest, and you're going to hear it today as we conclude our series on beef on dairy, the good, the bad, and the ugly on this episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. everyone. This is the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. We are glad to have you tune in and joining us here for our program today. As you heard there in the opening, we're continuing on looking at this subject of beef on dairy, and we'll be getting into that in just a moment. It was a great episode last week as we started down that road. And in fact, if you didn't have the opportunity to hear last week's show, well, I'll tell you what, I'd encourage you to go and listen to that. You can find that through our podcast website at workingranchradio.com, or you can also find it on any podcast provider site out there as well. Now, just a note here I got from Dave Voth last week letting me know that the 2024 annual meeting of the Society for Range Management is coming up. Change on the Range is this year's theme. It'll be held in Sparks, Nevada, January 28th through February 1st. There's still time to get registered. In fact, I encourage you to go to their website at rangelands.org. Not only can you see the agenda of what all is going on, but you can also get registered there. Again, the website rangelands.org, 2024. 24 annual meeting of the Society for Range Management coming up January 28th through February 1st in Sparks, Nevada. Now, also on our show today, of course, the Captain Tim O'Byrne will be in later on with this week's Tim's Two Cents, and we'll hear from meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. But we have a lot on our agenda, so without further ado, let's jump back into our subject here today as we're joined now by Dr. Ty Lawrence, who is the Cavanus Davis Distinguished Chair in Meat Science and a professor of animal science at West Texas a m University and the director of the Beef Carcass Research Center, which we'll find out more about that in our next segment. But Dr. Lawrence, first of all, before we jump back into it, thanks for joining us here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. And I know as we look at this subject here today and we get into even some of the deeper concerns about beef on dairy, it's, it's going to be pretty honest, it's going to be pretty raw in some cases, and I appreciate that as we look at this. So let's jump into it, and let's talk about the things we last week. It was the good, the bad. Now we're into the ugly, so let's start there. So the, the ugly is really just one issue, and it's an issue that goes back to one of the reasons that the Packers said we don't want purebred Holsteins anymore, and that's liver abscesses. And the, the liver abscess is an issue uh, primarily because it slows productivity at the at the processor level, and in some cases, productivity comes to an absolute screeching halt. So, if you'll if you'll kind of follow along uh, with me just a moment, severe abscesses can cause some pretty fantastic inflammation and immune reactions within the body that can lead to the liver adhering to maybe the diaphragm and the diaphragm, maybe to the lungs and uh, the liver also maybe in some cases to the kidneys and or the four compartment stomach. And depending on severity of that adhesion, the the packer might lose, let's say the diaphragm in in cutting that carcass out. So let's say for instance, uh, this, this liver that's in front of me right now was well adhered uh, between the liver and the and the diaphragm, and I cannot get it out in my allotted time as the as the gutter. So I'm going to have to stop the chain. And when I stop the chain, not only does exactly my working area stop, but the entire kill. Mm-hmm. And so you could easily have 400 people that were productive and were doing their job now standing, waiting, wondering what why they're standing and waiting and wondering. And so in many cases, that's because the gut table came to a stop. 
And then just understand that there's a, a production system. And in, in many cases, these facilities have been designed so that when one thing stops, everything stops. Mm-hmm. Uh, and arguably for, for good safety measures. So I stopped the productivity for maybe 10 seconds, maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute. Well, there's a couple of things that happen there. Number one, we're not harvesting animals during the production time. And that time is never recaptured. So just because I stopped the animal, I stopped the chain for one animal today and we lost 30 seconds of productivity, well, you don't add 30 seconds to the end of the day. Those 30 seconds are never regained because of that one animal. And in the in the span of, of 30 seconds of downtime, that's approximately three to four animals that you will now not harvest at the end of the day simply because of one animal earlier in the day. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't sound like a lot. But when one stop becomes 200 or 300 or 400 stops and you realize at the end of the day, you're now not harvesting four or five or 600 cattle. And then in very severe cases, potentially even worse than that, well, now you're shorting work. And so that's meat that didn't slaughter today. That's meat that doesn't get cut and boxed and sold to a customer. And productivity is completely different than what you had intended. Uh, I have seen instances in which a processor was down at least a thousand animals, if not more, because of severe liver abscess dates. A thousand cattle that doesn't Mm. get killed, doesn't get sold, that doesn't get boxed, that's a game changer. Yeah. In addition to lost productivity, uh, let's go back to my example of the of the diaphragm being adhered to the liver. Well, uh, the diaphragm is fajita meat. And in the summertime in the United States, diaphragm often sells second only to tenderloin in per pound value. Hmm. Uh, it, it would be nothing in the summertime to have a, a you know a fifteen dollar per pound uh, fajita market. Hmm. And so, in the case of that adhered diaphragm, you're not selling that at all now. So your what was a, a high value product is now not a product at all and just became meat and bone meal. And so now you're also shorting very specific orders for, for fajita meat. Mm-hmm. And so those those issues culminate and they, they seem pretty innocuous, you know, you and me talking on uh, on the radio. But if you're a major processor and your your normal day would be to, to harvest five or six thousand cattle and your normal day would include five or six thousand diaphragm that go to your customers. And all of a sudden today I only have maybe 3,000 diaphragm, well, that's a, that's, that's a different problem mm-hmm. than that most people have. And if you were going to slaughter 5,000 cattle a day and you only got 4,500 slaughtered, that's also a different problem. Mm-hmm. And, and that has bigger market consequences for the entire beef industry. And, and it could have been simply due to a liver abscess issue. So I'll, I'll tell you that liver abscesses are the number one phone call I get mm-hmm. on a daily basis either from a packer or a cattle feeder or somebody who knows it's an issue and wants to talk about it and learn more and and how do we solve this? Mm-hmm. And in a, in a nutshell, we need to solve it with timely and appropriate gut health that begins at day one of the life of that animal. Okay. So go expand on that a little bit more because that's something that's not really, that's not conclusive to just the uh, dairy industry. That would be for everybody that raises a cloven hoofed animal that chews a cud. That's exactly right. So in, uh, in the dairy animal, we, you know, we take that calf from its dam uh, very early in life, day one, and that calf gets treated from uh, maybe even minute one wholly differently than the than the ranch reared calf. And I think we would argue that it gets treated most efficiently economically rather than most appropriately in terms of, of gut health. Mm-hmm. Um, I know of, an, of, a, of a local dairy operator who provides the calf steam flaked corn as part of their diet at day two of life. Now, I, I assure you that rumen has not developed at all at, by day two and uh, arguably probably isn't even appropriate to think about any uh, any starch of any kind for six weeks but that's where we're at that's mm-hmm. what we're uh, that's what we're observing and so the gut health of the animal is 
not part of the early life consideration. I'm not sure it's part of the life consideration, arguably at all in some mm-hmm. cases. Yeah. So that's what this boils down to. Yeah. Then, Dr. Lawrence, it kind of takes us into another conversation about that. And you and I were talking about a little bit before we went on air, too. And, and that is the, the conversation that's always revolved a little bit with the with the dairy industry. And that when we talk about animal welfare issues in agriculture, the baby calves uh, at the dairies are an issue that seems to come up. They, they are. You know, the, the calf ranch is, uh, is a unique environment. Uh, those where those calves are raised in a it's a little plastic box in many cases I guess some of them are, are wooden but most mostly what I see are plastic crates and it's it's kind of like a big dog house with a typically a small panel in front of it to keep them confined to a relatively small handful of square feet bordering on uh, probably no more than than 30 square feet at the most uh, where they can get in and around and 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 move in an individual manner. It's it's not like being raised on a ranch where that calf uh, nurses its mother 15, 20 times a day, sleeps in uh, you know on a bed of grass, runs and plays at will in the confines of you know a pasture scenario. Mm-hmm. That dairy calf is given a bottle uh, in most cases twice a day, in some cases three times a day, and in some cases it's given milk in a bucket. And uh, it's fed in a manner that it would need to uh, to drink the milk like water. Mm-hmm. But regardless of, of the mechanism, in few instances, is that calf allowed to milk uh, for the length of time that a ranch raised calf would be allowed to milk. And in most cases, those calves are forced off of milk and onto a concentrate diet. Uh, at a very, very young age. Uh, I, I've met people that are trying to get the calves off of milk as fast as 28 days, and I hear up to about 90 days uh, being about the longest that I that I hear of. And so I'm sure that there's multiple operations uh, somewhere in the middle uh, of those two values. Yeah. And so what I observe and what I am told is that milk is expensive, And that we've got to get this calf off of milk and onto feed as fast as possible. But uh, my argument from the from the outside is we're either doing it too fast or we're not doing it appropriately. And that's leading to the gut health challenges that lead to these very high rates of liver abscesses that we see at uh, in harvest. Mm-hmm. Well, let's take a break here. When we come back, we're going to continue. Dr. Ty Lawrence with West Texas A&M University is our guest today as we're talking beef on dairy. This segment today brought to you by Diamond V, natural immune support postbiotic feed additives because your animal's health deserves a healthier approach. Find out more at diamondv.com. Stick with us. We'll be back on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. When your goal is to help animals reach their full potential, health matters. Diamond V offers a fresh perspective on animal health, a perspective that supports gut health, strengthens immunity, and enhances performance. For those who choose to invest in keeping healthy animals healthy, feeding Diamond V makes a statement about another dimension of profit, where margins are measured by confidence in your future. To get a fresh perspective, visit diamondv.com, because animal health deserves a healthier approach. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. As we continue on our subject today, we're looking at beef on dairy. This is part two of a two-part series. If you missed last week's show, episode 151, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that on any podcast provider out there. Dr. Ty Lawrence, who's the Cavanus Davis Distinguished Chair in Meat Science at West Texas A&M University, also a professor of animal science there, but he is also the director of the Beef Carcass Research Center. Now, Dr. Lawrence, before we jump back into talking about our subject of beef on dairy. I wanted you to give us a little bit of a background and information about what the Beef Carcass Research Center is. So the, the Beef Carcass Research Center is an industry service that was started by my mentor, Dr. Ted Montgomery. Uh, he, he began it as a, as a fledgling industry service for that started out actually in, in liver abscesses, partnering with uh, Elanco and IBP in the, in the mid-1970s. And he grew that into uh, a research service for the entirety of the beef industry and has grown uh, over years 
I was fortunate enough to be uh, chosen to take over uh, where he left off in uh, in 2004. And I've been uh, running that program for the last 20 years. And so we provide research services to the beef industry in all major commercial processors across North America. Most of what we do is research data in the, in the United States, but it's not uh, uncommon for uh, my team and I to be found in Canada doing the same thing as well for that industry and those producers up there. And so it might be as innocuous as uh, matching your ear tags to your carcass for EPD data. Okay. Uh, it might be uh, evaluating carcasses for salmonella or E. coli prevalence and, uh, and concentration. It might be liver abscess related. Uh, somebody may have developed a new feed additive or a new growth promoting implant or a new antibiotic or in, in the industry, i.e. The, the company that developed it, the Food and Drug Administration, USDA may want to know what that does to the carcass. So uh, we provide a, a litany of research services that uh, are within the confines of America's major beef processors. And so that uh, allows me and, and my team the opportunity to interact with uh, the beef industry on a, on a daily basis and stay attuned to uh, industry ongoings and, and the issues that, uh, that surround putting beef on America and the world's plate. Okay. Well, I think for all of us, that's something we'd all like to see that continue to happen. So we appreciate the work that you're doing there with the Beef Carcass Research Center and kind of thinking probably should have had you explain that when we first started too, because I think that also gives a, a good foundation of why you understand this particular subject the way that you do. So I appreciate that insight of talking about the Beef Carcass Research Center and the work that's being done there on behalf of the beef industry. Now, Dr. Lawrence, as we jump back into the subject of beef on dairy, and I want to go back to the very one of the very first or second segments that we were talking, and that was in regards to doing a beef cross on these dairy animals. In the last several years, we've really seen genomics start to come into the industry, just beef industry as a whole. And I'm, when I say beef, I mean everybody. That's English bread, continental breads to dairy breeds, whatever that may be. Where are we seeing that? That's got to play a big part of this where we can get the DNA results from our, from our cows and really then match up something on the beef side of things that gets us the, the carcass desire that they want. Is that what you're seeing as well? Absolutely. So one of the one of the big uh, takeaways from all of this is the success of the dairy producer in working with their genetic supplier, uh, you know, often through semen and actually in some cases through embryos to improve the next cycle. And the the rate of change, the rate of improvement of the dairy industry is is a, something that the beef folks need to look at and and copy, follow, chase, you know, use, use whatever vernacular you want to use. But uh, the beef industry can make the same type of improvement and they can make the same rate of change. They just haven't done so in most regards thus far. The dairy industry is smaller. It's, it's more concentrated, you know, and, and, uh, and a fewer number of larger players. And that has allowed them to accelerate the, the velocity of their improvement. And that's a, that's, a, that's a big win for beef in general. And that's something that the beef, uh, the traditional non-dairy beef population should look to uh, to improve that herd at a, at a much faster velocity, uh, just like the dairy folks have done. Yeah. And I think we're starting to see that. But I think one of the things you talked about there, too, is that's been really key is for the most part, fewer players are really, you know, definitely more of a closed herd concept in some way with the dairy industry versus a, a beef industry uh, and that's definitely helped to see that geno use of genomics increase quite a bit so i want to go to the next part of this and as a beef producer i know a lot of folks listening to working ranch radio show probably a majority of them are those that are we're going to call our beef producers of some sort and i think when we hear some of this going on we're wondering okay is this competition for us because we're starting to see like right now when our when our herd is so small and we need beef beef in the supply chain um everybody's getting a, a, a fair good price on on beef for the most part but what happens when the cycle changes a little bit is this going to be a competitive product for us as beef producers 
so in in the manner that we see these cattle being reared today, uh, I would not be of concern if I had a high quality calf. And, and I say that because uh, the, these things come with issues. Uh, with with very few exceptions, are they the most desirable product in your feed yard, mm-hmm. uh, or the most desirable product in your uh, in your slaughterhouse? They're a, a product, and the rearing system has yet to successfully match what can be done in a ranch scenario. You know, in in terms of in terms of genetics, in terms of feed efficiency, in terms of productivity. There, there are a lot of goods, and I, and I highlighted those in, mm-hmm. in earlier segments. There's some bads that need to be cleaned up, and the, the ugly has to be cleaned up before these things become competitive. So I'll be, I'll be quite surprised if we ever arrive at a point in, uh, in this country where uh, this animal would sell at a premium to a beef camp. I, I actually don't ever see that happening. They might get to par someday. But we're quite a ways away from that actually happening in today's market. I just don't see the the level of value in that animal to get there. Yeah. Now, what they might really compete well with and maybe uh, be at a premium to would be a, an animal that we would call Category B. That may be an, an animal that is of uh, Mexican origin. Okay. Uh, they might also be at a premium to an animal that is you know, a, a number two or a, or a number two and a half or a number three, something that would be of, of low quality or genetics or growth genetics or feeding genetics. I, I don't want to disparage any particular part of the country, but there's a lot of producers that, uh, you know, they turn a bull out year round and they get calves and they don't <laughs> castrate them and they don't vaccinate them and they don't wean them mm-hmm. until they take them to the auction market. Uh, you know, the day of sale. Yeah. Those animals, you know, they probably will be at a discount to a good quality dairy reared animal. So yeah. I'm sure there are pockets of cattle that are actually selling at a discount to these good dairy crossbreds today. But as a, as a rule, that's highly unlikely across the country and certainly will likely never happen for some high quality good stock yeah and i know we talked about this at the break you and i when we were off air and 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 we don't necessarily go into too much detail but one of the things you had said because we would not necessarily see the beef on dairy animal be a competitive product to our higher quality beef beef calves because of the rearing comes back to some element of that do you think there would be any value at some point that the dairies would change that out or is that just it's just not real feasible for them so I, the value, I, I believe, is there. They just haven't put forth an effort to try something novel and different. The dairy is, you know, quite accustomed to removing that calf from day one and treating it completely different than a, than a ranch-reared calf. And I, I see subtle versions of, of people trying things, but I don't see anything meaningful. Mm-hmm. The gut health aspect of their early life is so important. And I don't see any change, any sea change that makes a meaningful move of the needle thus far that would get that calf to an equal situation to a ranch reared calf. So previously I asked about genomics. Let's go a different element of that. Still staying with some very scientific elements that are part of breeding. What about, are these any of these guys looking in, at embryo type elements, uh, you know, where they're getting a hundred percent uh, beef animal out of that. Of course, it's not going to change the rearing element. If that doesn't change, then we're still back to maybe the ground floor on some of this. But is there any embryo work in this where they're putting 100% beef embryos in these animals? Absolutely. There are there are pockets of these of these animals where the uh, the, the calf is you know maybe purebred Angus or purebred you know something else. Uh, so that that does occur. It's very very small in the in the total uh, scope and volume of things. You know, one of the things that we really haven't talked about is the inefficiencies of the dairy herd in conception. Uh, oh yeah. You know, let's say if we had a, a a beef calf, be a beef cow, pardon me, and we were going to AI a, a herd of beef cows. Well, you know, fifty five to sixty percent uh, conception rate wouldn't be unheard of. Hmm. Well, if we move that same 
system to uh, to dairy, uh, you're probably talking 30 to 35 percent conception rate from the same technician, the same setup. And so there's just a, a sea change in conception efficiency as you move to the dairy world. And it's much worse, not much better. Yeah. So you would you would have the same values, yet lower percentages with embryo transfer. And so you, now you made a, a high value embryo and you get a calf out of it, you know, less than 30 percent of the time. Yeah. Well, you're probably doing that for uh, breeding and genetic selection purposes. You're probably not doing that for food production. Mm-hmm. Uh, at some point, those higher dollar embryos just don't pencil out uh, if you're trying to make, uh, you know, beef for society. Yeah. So, it, it, yes, it does occur. And it's in it's in quite small percentages of the overall population. Yeah. And so yeah. that's one of the big improvements that the dairy industry needs to look to improve on is uh, is their fertility and conception rates. Yeah. And uh, they're a long way behind uh, <laughs> beef cattle in yeah. that realm. Well, we're going to take another break here. We have one more segment. Dr. Ty Lawrence is my guest today. We're talking beef on dairy. Boy, I'll tell you what, we've covered an awful lot. When we come back, we're going to wrap up this conversation about what are some of the things that we as beef producers could learn from what the dairy industry is doing. We'll take a look at that when we return here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. This segment brought to you by the American Gelvie Association. Make your crossbreeding count with Gelvie and Balancer Genetics. Find out more at gelvie.org. We'll be back after this. Capitalize on crossbreeding with Gelvie and Balancer Bulls. Raise replacement females with added fertility, increased longevity, and greater productivity. Gelvi and Balancer influenced females wean more pounds of calf per cow exposed. In the feed yard, Balancer influenced cattle offer increased performance, improved feed efficiency, and had excellent carcass merit. Balancers add the pounds, make the grade, and deliver the value. Make your crossbreeding count with Gelvi and Balancer Genetics. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. You know, in our industry today, we've got a lot of choices when it comes to supplements. But with new generation supplements, it's not just another tub. No, they've been doing this for 27 years as they started back in 1997 to be a research-focused supplement manufacturer. Now, you might know new generation supplement products by the name of Smart Lick, Feed in a Drum, or Mega Lick. They're proven products with extensive university research with over 70 unique formulas because they know the supplement needs from one part of the country are different than the other part. And of course, it's also about performance. New generation supplements have the essential vitamins and minerals needed that enhance the reproductive performance and forage utilization of your herd. And at the end of the day, it's about their people. They know the forages, the challenges, and how they can help you with the products that they have with over 2,000 dealers all across the United States and Canada. New generation supplements, research-driven, field-proven supplement solutions, Find out more at newgensupplements.com. Well, as we continue now and we wrap up our discussion here today, Dr. Ty Lawrence is our guest from West Texas A&M University. What are some things that we as beef producers could maybe learn from what the dairy industry is doing? And I'm just going to throw it out to, as a question like that and have you answer it. Sure. So uh, one of the positives, I'll, I'll go back to the, the earlier segments, mm-hmm. is that uh, that agent source verification opportunity uh, the, again, the dairy industry does a fantastic job of identifying the calf, matching it back to the sire and the dam and the dairy and the calf ranch and the entire production stream. And that's a lesson that the, the beef industry can take note of, the, I'll say the non-dairy beef industry, uh, and figure out how to do that in a manner that improves the, the operation at home, the, the producer, and improves value all the way to a consumer. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we need to wait on the government to tell us to do it, figure out how to do it in a voluntary grassroots home manner and uh, figure out how to add value to your individual operations. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the traceability was something that I know is, has some controversy in our industry. I think some, the real concern is whether it's mandated from the government or not. Uh, We do see a lot of folks entering into beef branded programs, which is some element of some traceability in that. So I think for, for the beef industry as a whole to have that into consideration would be some value. What else do you see that the dairy industry has done that would be valuable for the beef producers? The, the other the other big win in in their world is the rate of improvement. Uh, so okay. the, the, again, those large dairy operations have the ability to reach across uh, you know across the aisle, so to speak, into our beef sires, and they can improve their production system by grabbing our uh, fantastic beef sires. And pay, you know, making a, a crossbred calf that is at the at the genetic cusp of improvement, and you just don't see that velocity of improvement in a traditional beef ranching scenario. Mm-hmm. And so that's another that's another thing that the beef ranch community needs to look at and say, hey, uh, I might actually be falling behind dairy producers who are making rates of improvement. And, and this is typically in a terminal scenario. Yeah. You know, rates of improvement in quality, rates of improvement in growth, rates of improvement in, you know, maybe non-maternal outcomes at a much faster rate than many beef producers are making. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they're at risk of falling behind if they don't uh, make those same improvements in that terminal animal. Do you think, though, Dr. Lawrence, that could be a little bit of our Achilles tendon in the beef side of this, the non uh, non dairy beef side of the industry a bit? You talked about, as we were saying, as I had asked you in the previous segment, do you think that any of these dairies will change in the in the way that they're starting these calves in the rearing of these calves? You said, well, you know, there's so much tradition and this is how they do that. And I, I wonder that in that thinking along those same lines, because for non-dairy beef producers like myself, there's just so many of us and and we all kind of have our own idea of what we think we want <laughs> that I mean I can make some changes in my herd, but as a as if we put all of our cows together in one herd, we're really slow to make that change. It's kind of our Achilles tendon a bit. In, in a manner it is, yes. And I, I would likewise say that the, the dairy industry has two Achilles tendons. One is the extremely poor uh, conception rate that we observe in, in dairy animals. The second is the rearing of that calf. You know, and, and I'll, I've not used the word byproduct thus far in, in this uh, in this mm-hmm. program, but even with the value of a crossbred calf, few people would argue that the dairy treats it as anything other than a byproduct. Yeah. Uh, those animals are not cared for in a manner, even a approximately equivalent to a ranch reared calf. The care is different, obviously, because it's it's a human and not, not a beef dam. Mm-hmm. But the life of that animal is wholly different. And its gut health, as I've mentioned previously, is wholly different. And so that leads to many of the problems that we see at the end of that animal's life at their harvest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And without a, without a sea change in the rearing of those calves... The dairy beef world, be it purebred or crossbred, well, will have a tough time catching up to the desired end product of a a beef calf. Yeah. Well, Dr. Lawrence, uh, we've covered an awful lot in these two episodes last week as we looked at part one of this, part two this week, looking at the subject of beef on dairy. We've covered a lot of things. And before we go, I just want to give you some final comments as we wrap up our conversation. I invite the beef community to constantly be on the lookout for something that adds value to their individual operation. You know, it it might be as simple as changing the hair coat color of of your sire. Mm -hmm. It might be as simple as marketing your calves uh, to a consistent downstream customer year after year after year, rather than just the market at will and and who buys them buys them. Mm -hmm. So don't be a traditionalist in every sense of the word, because sticking to tradition can sometimes leave you wanting opportunity that may never appear. And so, you know, you may, every once in a while, you may have to go out and, and make your opportunity uh, in this industry. Yeah. 
Well, Dr. Lawrence, I appreciate you coming in here and just tell you for myself, very educational. It was a segment of our industry I was not real familiar with and really looked at it with some concern and, you know, kind of like a border collie dog looks at you with his head tilted, kind of wondering whether this was a good or a bad thing. I know one of the elements that I also continue to hear is that some people have said it's a it's a good thing because it's putting better beef in our system so that the consumer is getting a better experience. That's something I've heard as well. Absolutely. And uh, we'll, we'll continue to make more and higher quality products year over year, decade over decade, as we continue to make improvements in the entirety of our beef industry, uh, not one particular segment over the other. You bet. Well, Dr. Lawrence, I, you gave us more time than what I'd asked for. I appreciate you joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. My pleasure. And again, Dr. Ty Lawrence is with West Texas A&M University and the director of the Beef Carcass Research Center. If you'd like to find out more information about the Beef Carcass Research Center, you can just search in your browser, Beef Carcass Research Center, and you'll get right to the website there with more information about that. Now, one final note, and I wanted to bring this up, and I don't know if you caught it, but it was just something that he said in the very last part of his comments there, and I wrote it down. It said He said this, don't be a traditionalist because sticking to tradition can sometimes leave you wanting opportunity that may never appear. thought that was interesting. I want you to think about that as we head into our next break. We'll be back on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. Joining us now is Jeremy Martin and Travis Chrisman with Stockman Source Beef Bulls. Guys, glad to have you back here on the program today. Glad to be back. Thank you, Justin. Well, all of us are just kind of sitting, probably taking a little bit of a reprieve. It's been awfully cold here, and uh, we're enjoying maybe a chance to get in out of the out of the cold. But nevertheless, uh, you guys have your bull sale coming up on the third of February. Before we get into that, though, let's talk a little bit. This is the time of the year where a lot of guys are out shopping for bulls, looking for genetics. There's just a lot of things we can be looking at, and I know one of the things as we come out of this cold temperature and we're in in the middle of this, it really does reflect back. And I know as is uh, Jeremy and Travis, as we were talking before we went on air, I know, Travis, one of the things you'd mentioned is it just does cause you to kind of maybe sit back a little bit and think about, boy, we really need to be looking at bulls and genetics that are quite functional in the environments that they're going to be raised in, huh? Yeah, Justin, I was I was just thinking this morning as I was out uh, choring and, you know, we're below zero and the wind's blowing. And, you know, as I, as I keep in mind how to genetically uh, make choices in the future you know we just we got to take care of the fundamentals we need we need cattle that can go out and forage we need cattle that got some foot and some bone and some muscle so they can they can take that abuse in this these rough conditions you know we had a lot of open cattle all the way from kansas through the dakotas and montana and that was from opens most likely caused from drought stress and the stress of last winter and so we know that fertility is paramount in profitability for the commercial cow calf guy, and we need to keep that at top of mind. And so that's that's something that uh, that we're always going to focus on, and uh, we just got to have it. Now I know Jeremy, as we were talking as well, one of the things you know you you yourself feed a lot of cattle out, and so one of the things that you're looking at is I mean you got to have bulls that are making good steers and making cattle that'll feed that'll grade that'll do what they need to do, not only from a terminal standpoint but also from a maternal standpoint and that balance is in there and when you talk about your operation there that you've got, it's not just what you're trying to sell but what you think is useful because of your own operation that feeds a lot of cattle. Yeah, we're kind of uh, we're kind of on both sides of the bull deal, right? I mean, first and foremost, we're striving to raise uh, the most profitable steers that we can, and then uh, you know what we consider the best end of them make the cut and make a bull sale for us, and we sell those bulls, and then we buy quite a few steers and heifers back that are sired by them. You know, we certainly don't buy every calf that they sire, but uh, we're in that market enough to uh, participate as much as as we can, and and we. Uh, breed some of these customer heifers and make bread heifer project out of them. We feed quite a few of the steers. And so we're just really focused on, on making no problems for anybody because we want the bulls to go out and last and do a good job. We want steers to come into the feedlot, stay healthy and get big. We're not going to offer a bull that we got to treat for respiratory because I don't want to deal with the steers out of him after I buy them. We're not going to offer a bull that's presented us a problem because 
there's a good chance we see those problems come back to us down the road and we just want to eliminate them. Yeah. And so we're selling bulls, but we're net buyers of cattle. And, you know, we try and do everything with that downstream approach in mind. Yeah. One of the things that I know in your feeding of your bulls and as you're getting them ready to go, a lot of these bulls are going to be coming to your old bulls, maybe a little older bulls than what some guys are buying as you're getting them developed. One of the things is that you really have been focused for quite some time on bulls that are raised in more range type conditions that we're not putting a uh, hot feed into them to the point that they're going to melt once they get through a breeding season. That's a pretty big part of how they're developed. Absolutely. Yeah. We, uh, you know, that first winter on these coming two-year-olds, they they graze corn stalks with their steer mates and, and oftentimes with some purchased steers too. And we supplement them with a little distillers and then reevaluate them in the spring. And, you know, the ones that make the cut for bulls go back to grass. And, you know, this fall, we kind of started supplementing them a little bit, get them ready for a sale, but they've never been pushed hard. They've walked a lot of miles getting rotated from cornfield to cornfield. And we just think we've gone to the extreme to make sure that we put the best sword on them that we can. Mm-hmm. I was just going to add to that. Uh, we, we got a set of two-year-old bulls down here and, you know, they, they were in the canyon grazing until the first of December on, and got a little cake. And uh, anyway, we just, we think it's important that these bulls, if they're developed an extensive grazing system like that, that's what they're going to be in the rest of their life. So it just makes logical sense in our mind to do that. We want you to be happy with your your bull every year and how he looks going forward Mm -hmm. well before we head to the details of the sale that's coming up here one of the things i did want to mention the national western stock show of course is held in january and you guys participated in the commercial heifer sale that took place there travis pretty happy with how that turned out yep we took a group of sim angus bred heifers and uh, they're about quarter simital three quarters angus and it was called the maternal merit commercial female's tail. So these were these were commercial heifers we bought back off one of our customers, the Coates Ranch in South Dakota. And uh, we were just trying to get our get our name out there and let people see our stock. And, and we were very pleased. A group of the heifers actually topped that sale over all the breeds represented. So it was, it was a fun time and we we're just glad our cattle met with good approval. You bet. Well, guys, let's talk a little bit of the details of the sale coming up. It's a Stockman Source Beef Bulls uh, sale that's coming up. That is on February 3rd of this year. If you go to the website, ssbeefbulls.com, you can have the catalog already. But Jeremy, uh, let's give us some of the details of that because I know that's going to be close to where you're headquartered there. So I'll let you give us some of the details to start out here on the sale. Yeah. So uh, we're pretty excited. We've got a, a new sale facility. We're southwest of North Platte, uh, about 30 miles west of Wellfleet, Nebraska. And uh, we've got a building in progress. And uh, if we get a couple nice days, we'll have it done in plenty of time for the sale. But uh, we're looking forward to having kind of a heated indoor facility. we got a nice set of pins to view the bulls in. Bulls will be up there ahead of time. And we sure welcome yeah, anybody to come take a look at stuff that's going on around here before the sale too and we sure drive you through the cows and you can see that uh you know they do what we say they'll do they're they're out grazing today and that's just what they do every day of the year mm-hmm. travis a few more details here we've got uh angus and sim angus bulls uh, give us the details on the amount of lots and number of head you're going to be looking at with each of those yeah justin they'll be roughly um 45 Angus bulls and then the balance 115 or whatever will be uh, Sim Angus bulls. The Sim Angus mostly quarter, half bloods, not many high percentage bulls. Mm -hmm. All these bulls been genomically tested through their respective breed associations. So you've got the most accurate uh, information available for all the traits. And then they're sired by proven bulls that have been well accepted by the industry as well as bulls we've raised out of our top end cows that have also been uh, progeny tested through the feedlot and carcass records. So a lot of data behind these cattle selling. Okay. All right. So we have the sale. It will be, like we said before, February 3rd, it's going to be at 12 noon for the viewing on that. And Jeremy, like you had said too, if, you know, folks want to get there or come by at any point in time, you know, you have an opportunity to get, take a look at those three o'clock central time is the sale for that. Jeremy or Travis, either one of you want to give us some details on how that sale will go down. Yeah, just it's a quiet auction format. We'll have bulls pinned up at about noon. Welcome people to uh, come through, grab a bite to eat, and take a look through the bulls. Uh, we'll start the quiet auction at 3 o'clock, and 
Now that's just a very transparent, very easy to follow system that's worked well for us. It goes quick and there's never any doubt about who's in or who's out or, or what number we're at. And so it's been very well accepted and uh, we're going to continue to do that. And afterwards, I uh, invite everybody to stick around, have a good steak and, and visit for a while. You bet. And that will also be on DV auction. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Well, guys, before we uh, head out here, just some final comments from each of you. Just, I would remind folks that we're online, um, ssbeefbulls.com and we have a catalog up. So come look for us there and check out our Facebook page also for timely information and updates. Okay. Jeremy. Yeah. We just would welcome anybody to check us out. We have a few more bulls to offer, which is a direct result of uh, growing our cow herds. Cows are working for us and the bulls and the steer progeny and the heifers out of them are working for us and and we'd sure like to give them a chance to work for somebody else you bet and one thing i didn't mention as well guys was most of these are coming two-year-old bulls there's a few 18 month old bulls in those sim angus but most of these are going to be good mature bulls right Yes, sir. They're ready to go to work. All right. Well, guys, uh, appreciate it. Thanks again for joining us here. Stockman Source Beef Bull Sale going on. It's the website you can get to is ssbeefbulls.com. That is where you can go and find all the information. The videos coming along. Their catalog is already online. You can find them there. And again, that website, ssbeefbulls.com. Guys, thanks for joining us here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Thank you. Take care. Yep. Thanks, Justin. You bet. And again, that was Jeremy Martin, Travis Chrisman with Stockman Source Beef Bulls joining us here today. A joint venture between their family operations, Jeremy and his wife, Gail, on the Broken Bar AM Ranch and Travis and his family on the Chrisman Family Cattle. Their sale coming up on February 3rd. They'll start the viewing at 12 noon Central Time and they'll drop the gavel at 3 p.m. Central Time. That can also be viewed on DV Auction. We'll be back on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. Looking for the perfect gift for a gardener or weather enthusiast? Introducing the Tropo, a precision rain gauge that has revolutionized both reliability and convenience. Expertly engineered by meteorologists, the Tropo gauge boasts rugged durability, impeccable accuracy, and precision to the hundredth of an inch. Visit MeasureRain.com to order a Tropo today and use code RAINDAY, that's R-A-I-N-D-A-Y, for free shipping and 10% off. Go to Measure rain.com hey justin hey everybody out there in working ranch radio land this morning i am traveling westbound through the great state of texas uh sun's coming up just uh, past the little town of snyder got my radio tuned to ksny fm 101.5 great little radio station and um the tsn lone star farm and ranch morning report comes on and the gal mentions this they just signed something into a tax law here the other day that allows farmers and ranchers to, uh, and this is on the federal level, to be able to claim 100% of their machinery purchases. So why don't you check up on that down the road, fill us in a little bit on that. Big shout out to KSNY. I uh, love these little small town radio stations. I hope they never go away. This one took a lot of respectful time as the the good rural radio stations do to mention the local obituaries and give a a nice uh, send off to the great folks that pioneer that country. God bless them and uh, have a great week out there. Back to you, Justin. All right. Thanks, Captain. And I'm wondering, are you cruising through Texas in your work and ranch pickup? Well, folks, if you're kind of wondering what that means, take a listen to last week's Tim's Two Cents, and maybe you want to sign up for a working ranch pickup. Well, let's check in now with meteorologist Don Day as we take a look at our long-term weather. And Don, I think for a lot of us, it's kind of like a big breath and just kind of maybe some relief that we're seeing ahead of this extreme cold weather that we all experienced across the country. Before we get into that, I know one of the things that these storms have been bringing is much-needed snow pack yeah the, the this recent spell of uh, arctic weather has brought not only significant snow to the low elevations but there were some areas that really got a big boost in the snowpack not everybody though as usually is the case there's winners and losers but we saw snowpack increases as much as 20 to 30 percent um in the upper colorado basin 
a North Platte Basin, some of the Green River Basin, some of the real critical big snow basins in the Central Rockies, uh, the mountains of Utah as well, did really, really well. Now, we still are looking at really low snowpacks in Montana, northern Wyoming, uh, northern Idaho, um, but it looks like the, the central mountain ranges of the west had their biggest snow of the winter season so far. We're talking about four to six inches of water went into some of those basins. And so that can really help things very, very quickly, but we've got some other areas that need more. And there could be some folks in the Midwest that say, well, we have a snowpack. I mean, if you look at uh, the amount of snow that's fallen across parts of Nebraska and South Dakota and Iowa and Southern Wisconsin, um, there's a lot of snow on the ground in parts of the Corn Belt. So they've got their their own snowpack right now. Yeah, for sure. You know, as as this is kind of migrating out this cold, that western part of the country, the west coast, uh, down into California, southern California, and even across into Arizona and New Mexico, getting a little moisture through some of this here in the near term. Yeah, after this uh, Arctic air exits the far eastern parts of the United States by late this weekend and early next week, the Pacific is going to open up and it's a really good pattern for California, uh, but also for Washington and Oregon. And as you mentioned, Arizona, parts of Nevada and parts of Utah and eastern areas of Arizona into western New Mexico, they're going to see some decent amounts of rain and some mountain snow. So that is going to be good to see. Mm -hmm. But with that Pacific air flowing in now across the U.S., that's going to moderate the temperatures. So temperatures are not going to be as severely cold. At the same time, I wouldn't expect them to get too warm either. We talked about that snow cover. With snow cover pretty extensive, uh, that's going to throttle back temperatures a little bit. But the weather is going to catch its breath. And after a a big, large Arctic outbreak like this, uh, that's so big, you usually see the the weather pattern go through a readjustment phase. That can go seven to ten days where things aren't as stormy. Uh, But we could very well see things get reloaded again as we get into February. Mm -hmm. Where are you seeing then this next big cold phase coming in and where would it and how is it going to look? There are indications that uh, we could see a reloading of the northern latitudes building up cold air again. Right now, I would say between the, the last part of the first week and into the second and third weeks of February is when I would watch out again for the possibility of another Arctic outbreak, whether or not it's going to be of the scale and the magnitude of what we just experienced, we'll have to see. Mm -hmm. But we've got a lot going on. We've got the opportunity to build more Arctic air. We still have the El Nino going on, although it is getting weaker. But there's a lot of moving parts. We've seen this historically in some other years. And in those years, usually February gave us another shot. And that's something that we'll keep an eye on. But I would say between the 7th and the 14th of February is kind of the rough guess on when that would be. Okay. All right, Don. Well, appreciate the information here today and wish you well in this next week. Sounds good. And again, that is meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. If there's ever a time to check out his daily video podcast, it's now. And the weather we've been having, you can check it out at dayweather.com. We'll be back on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. The January-February issue of Working Ranch Magazine is out. And by the way, if you don't have a subscription, it's pretty easy to get started. You can go to workingranchmag.com and get your subscription started. By the way, if you are in the market of buying bulls this year, this is kind of the one-stop shop where you can find a lot of the different contact information of the bull sales going on all across the country. Take a look in the latest issue of Working Ranch Magazine. Now, if you do like to get a hold of me, maybe have comments, questions, ideas for a show, or even concerns, I'll take those two. You can send me an email at justin.workingranch at gmail.com. The Working Ranch Radio Show is a production of Working Ranch Magazine, branded number one by America's Ranchers. I'm Justin Mills, and until next time, keep your chin down and your mind in the middle. So long.